Hello and welcome to the PASA webinar of the climate crisis uh, and the impact of climate change on primates. We will be getting started momentarily. Uh, thanks everyone for joining from all around the world. We've got a fantastic panel uh, and we are just waiting for one of our panelists who is in Uganda to join us. So uh, just give us one moment and we'll be getting underway. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, Dr. Gladys is on her way, so we will go ahead and get started. And with that, I'm going to hand it to my colleague, Iris Ho, to take to get this through. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jane. And um, hello everyone. Uh, greetings from Lyon, France. Uh, I'm currently attending uh, a meeting of the Convention on International Trade uh, in Endangered Wildlife. Uh, fauna and, and flora. And so it's very topical that we're talking about um, uh, conservation of, uh, of, uh, of monkeys and primates. And uh, we have a diverse panel today um, and with extinguished, uh, distinguished speakers. Um, and also I'd like to give a shout out to um, our, our women participants, audience members, a very belated uh, International Women's Day. Uh, to uh, um, all the female conservationists um, and wildlife supporters um, out there uh, in the field and around the world. And um, I, will, I will be running uh, the program today. And um, our, our program today um, 
will have multiple speakers. Um, first, uh, I will introduce uh, PASA for the audience members who are less familiar with, with uh, our organization. Um, and then I will go uh, straight into our um, the honorable uh, guests. We have uh, three heavyweight speakers. Uh, first up is uh, Minister Lee White uh, from Gabon. And then after he gives an opening remark, I will be uh, having a short presentation about PASA's climate crisis uh, report. And after that, uh, we have Dr. Gladys, uh, who will be giving her, uh, her perspective, One Health perspective, and how that intersects with climate change. And last but not least, uh, we have a perspective uh, from a PASA member sanctuary, Opechata Conservancy, and Samuel, the head of conservation, will be giving that presentation. And afterwards, we will open um, the floor for Q&A. And in the meantime, during the presentation and during the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat or in the Q&A uh, se section. Um, so first, uh, as I said earlier, um, I will be introducing uh, my organization, our organization, Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance for audience members who are not that familiar with us. Uh, PASAP uh, was created in 2000, uh, year 2000, and it was founded by a group of sanctuary, wildlife sanctuary leaders. Um, they were, they realized that they were facing similar challenges, but there was no platform to communicate. And that's why they created this alliance. And since then, uh, as of today, we have 23 primate sanctuaries and wildlife centers across 13 African countries. And we have created a network uh, with, with uh, NGOs on the ground uh, and also scientists, veteran, veterinarians and volunteers and supporters um, around the world. And our member uh, sanctuaries uh, first, and, and they do a variety diverse uh, range of work. First and foremost, they care uh, for animals, they rescue and care for primates um, and other animals. I think, you know, with the, with the pandemic um, still going on uh, uh, for, for two years, uh, we know, we value uh, and we know the importance of he healthcare workers. Um, and we know that, you know, not all heroes wear capes. And I would like to say, you know, it will be the same for our member sanctuaries uh, who, uh, you know, performed care um, and rescue for, uh, for primates uh, and other wildlife. And um, in addition to, to daily work of caring for these animals, they also run uh, diverse programs. Uh, they, um, they, 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 for example, you know, they address long-term threats facing primates um, and other wildlife uh, from poaching, uh, trafficking, habitat loss to climate change, which is uh, the main focus of our topic today. And they also provide educational programs uh, to kids and adults uh, living in, in, in their communities. And this is an area for me, you know, personally, um, I am very, very um, uh, supportive of educating of our young uh, generation. I have a four-year-old niece. Uh, so a lot of what I do um, is, 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 you know, is related to what kind of planet uh, that we are going to leave, leave uh, for the young generation. Um, and our member sanctuaries, they also work uh, to conserve uh, wild spaces. Many of them are located in or near essential habitats of primates. And so they, they work with local governments and community to preserve or some would you know, be creating new protected areas uh, for primates and other wildlife. And they would also, they also have uh, sustainable livelihood programs uh, to generate uh, incomes uh, for the community members that uh, they, they work with. And overall, this coalition um, of PASA, uh, we are driving impact in many areas. Um, you know, from again, you know, the number of animals that we rescue, our members rescue and care for, uh, to providing employment opportunities uh, to the local communities, and, and also generating income. 
uh, to uh, to the members. Um, last year, we generate uh, almost uh, up to seven million uh, U.S. dollars uh, to local economies. When we talk about when we talk about primates um, and, and threats facing primates um, and and other other wildlife, uh, we have to talk about the 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 existing uh, looming uh, climate uh, crisis. Um, and you know the climate crisis, just like the biodiversity crisis, are affecting every being uh, on the planet. And today, uh, we are really honored uh, to have the presence um, of Dr. Lee White, uh, who is the Minister of Water, Forests, the Sea and Environment um, of Gabon. And uh, Dr. Lee White um, has a long and distinguished career um, in academia and also in public service. Um, he has a, a, a long, career in, in the West and in Central African forest belt, spanning 35 years. Um, and I hope I'm not giving your, your age away, uh, Minister White. Um, and he was awarded the commander of the British, the, the commander of the order of the Brit British Empire for his public service. And he's an ideal expert for our topic uh, today not the least uh, because he has uh, a PhD on forestry's impact on wildlife and climate change, but he also has decades of firsthand on the ground experiences how to combat climate change. And so without further ado, I will turn the floor to Dr. White. Thanks, Sirius. I worried your statistics might be slightly wrong and I might be coming up to 40 years of ah. trekking around the rainforest from Sierra Leone to Gabon to Burundi. Um, I will talk to you today um, partly as a climate change negotiator and climate change scientist. I actually um, was the spokesman for Africa in the COP26 recently. Um, uh, and I'll also talk to you as a sort of a, 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 a primate biologist and, and, and um, somebody who's been doing long-term science on forest primates climate um, in Central Africa for a long time. Um, something that many people don't realize is that about two and a half thousand years ago, there was a sort of a 500 year snap of climate change, a little bit like 500 years of El Nino altogether, hot, dry, hot, sunny, dry seasons, forest dried out, and almost anywhere where you dig a hole in Gabon or in um, northern Congo, you will find charcoal that can be carbon dated back to that period. Um, so it was a period when the rainforests of the Congo Basin burnt. Um, we hear about Southeast Asian peat forest burning, we hear about the Amazon burning, we hear about West African forests um, burning after logging. We don't tend to hear much about Central African you know, Congo Basin forest burning, but it has happened in the past and it was linked to climate change. Um, and so we have to, you know, we have to be very strategic about how we, we think about climate change into the future. Um, surely um, two and a half thousand years ago when almost all of the Gabonese forests burnt, it had a huge impact on primates, including ourselves. Um, Africa is, you know, we say it in the negotiations, um, it's becoming something that we repeat, but it, it's real. Africa is the continent that will be the most affected by climate change um, in terms of probably humanity. Uh, we're the least able to adapt and, and um, there are predictions that if climate change continues to, to go the way it's going, that it could destabilize 
over half of the African nations. It could result even in sort of war, war over natural resources, war over water in over half of the African countries. So it's, it's, it, we must not underestimate the, the potential impacts of climate change on this continent. Um, and when we look elsewhere, we look abroad, there was a, a paper came out, I think it was yesterday or the day before, in Nature, um, telling us that um, the resilience of the Amazon rainforests is, is disappearing, that the Amazon rainforests are getting close to a tipping point where they become a net um, producer of carbon dioxide that the Amazon trees are directly suffering from increased temperature, from, from increased frequency of droughts, uh, which results in increased frequency of fires. And, and we're almost at the point now where the Amazon rainforest will be dying quicker than it's growing. Um, that's a very, you know, a very serious message um, the paper actually predicts that maybe uh, a large part of the Amazon rainforest will be savannah in a few decades' time. Um, and, and so uh, what, what do we know about Africa and, 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 and the resilience of our African rainforests? I showed up in Gabon in 1989. Um, I arrived in Lupe. I worked with a, a lady called Caroline Chutin, who did the, with Michelle Fernandez, did the first ever gorilla and chimp survey in Gabon, and sort of put, really shone the spotlight on Gabon as a, a country that was important for conservation and particularly important for, for, for great apes, um, estimating 35,000 gorillas and 64,000 chimps back in 1983. Um, Caroline set up a long-term study of chimps and gorillas living sympatrically in the forest. And because it was so difficult to habituate, um, let's call them rainforest, lowland gorillas um, and, and chimps in, in the habitat of Gabon, which is much less lush. And so it, it, it takes you many, many years to get to, you know, to habituated apes. Um, whereas in Rwanda, you can usually do it in about a year. It was a real blessing, actually, for the planet, because, be because it was so difficult to habituate and, and track the gorillas, Caroline and her team um, started doing a lot of ecological work. They set up phenology circuits to monitor fruiting and flowering and leafing of all the, the, the tree species, that, and the liana species that the gorillas and chimps were eating. Liz Williamson, who worked with them, set up botanical plots to quantify the habitat of these apes. Um, and between um, Kate Abernethy, my wife and I, um, over the last 30 years or so, we've kept all of those data sets turning over. So every month we monitor over a thousand trees for flowering and fruiting and leafing. Every five years, uh, and we get a lot of help from Simon Lewis and his, his carbon plot people. Every five years, we repeat those, those plots and we've added to the plot data. Um, and what we've shown working um, on Gabon data, but working across the Congo Basin is the Congo Basin forests are actually much more resilient than the Amazon. That's the good news. Um, in terms of carbon accumulation, um, they continue to absorb CO2. That makes Gabon actually the most carbon positive country on earth because we net absorb over 100 million tons of CO2 every year. Um, but we published a paper last year um, in Nature, so a fairly high profile paper, um, where we analyzed 35 years of phenology data. And we, we showed that even though the carbon sequestration is still strong, so the trees are still growing as they always have, 
um, we showed that the fruit production um, of the trees was down by 80%, 80. There's been a crash in fruit production by rainforest trees in central Gabon. And most of the primates living in the forest are fruit or seed eaters, principally. Um, we didn't have 35 years worth of data on sort of body condition of primates. But because everybody loves elephants, we did have 60,000 photographs of elephants that we could place in time. And we analyzed, we scored them all for body condition of the elephant. So in some pictures you had chubby elephants, obviously you could, could barely see their ribs and so on. They were obviously in, in great health. But on some pictures we had really skinny elephants where their ribs were sticking out and their backbone was sticking out. And, and so we, we analyzed the, the, the downward trend in fruiting and we asked the question, are the elephants getting thinner? forest elephants eat fruits actually once published a paper proposing we reclassify forest elephants as apes um, and part of the it was a bit of a funny paper but part of the reason was that they have basically the same diet as gorillas um, and and so what transpired was the elephants have got significantly thinner over the last 20 years and we assume that is linked to this drop in fruiting and that's linked to climate change. Um, we can't really do the same analysis with chimps and gorillas because they're so hairy. Uh, so even if you have lots of you know, even photo trap photographs and so on, it's very difficult to do an analysis of the body condition. Um, so we haven't been able to generalize this analysis. We're trying with dikers now because we, we, we think um, we should be able to do it with dikers. But, what transpires from that analysis, I think, is really sinister because it's the first evidence we have that the African rainforest trees are being impacted negatively by climate change already. Um, the, the scary thing is we don't have any other 35 year data sets where we can test these things. So we've 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 Emma Bush at, at Edinburgh Botanic Garden has put together a, a network of phenology studies across Africa and across the world to try and start to look at, is this a generalized trend that rainforest trees are cutting off? Um, but but you know, I see this as a, a really stark warning to the world that yes, the African forests are more resilient, probably because they've been impacted by climate change more in the past but than, than other areas. Um, but actually they are starting to show signs of changing um, and if we don't get a hand on climate change then then you know an extreme scenario where where the plants start shutting down the plants start dying the forest starts drying out forest fires um, you know, insecurity in africa would be an absolute tragedy for 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 humans and for non-human primates, for the rainforests and, and sort of the planet as a whole. Um, and I think this science is, is, it's really important to feed this science into the climate change negotiations, um, make sure that our, our, our voice is strong, um, that everybody has to do all they can. I mean, I, I don't really need to say it um, to you guys, because we're all reading these reports from the IPCC and, and so on, which seem to get worse and worse and worse every time, every time they publish a new report. So slightly, I like to be optimistic, but I'm afraid that's slightly a message of doom and gloom. Uh, we really have to act now to deal with climate change. And if we don't, potentially it's the biggest threat to you know, biodiversity and humanity um, um, that's out there. And so sorry to be negative about that, but it's it's a call for it's a call for action. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Minister White. Um, I, I think, you know, for many of us who work in biodiversity, conservation, and then climate change issues, yeah, it's sort of a constant battles among ourselves, you know, all these grim, very grim pictures that we're seeing and frustrations that we're seeing. But in the meantime, we do, you know, have to maintain hopeful um, and continue uh, the fight uh, on all fronts. Uh, next, um, I will be sharing um, PASA's um, climate uh, uh, census, uh, sorry, census report. Sorry, I'm having a bit difficulty with my presentation. Iris, would you like me to run it? I can do that. Yes, yes, please. Thank you so much. My computer froze for some reason. Thank you so much, Jean. Jean. So every every year, um, PASA conducts a census survey among our twenty three uh, member sanctuaries uh, in different countries. And the purpose of the census report is to record uh, the number of the rescues and releases, as well as document uh, the species that are receiving care by our members. And our members uh, care for rescue and care for, uh, for, for animals beyond primates. Um, they have taken in, rescued, and rehabilitated um, other animals, other species, for example, pangolins, African uh, gray parrots uh, that are endangered species as well. And um, our census report also demonstrates uh, the impact that our members have um, on, on, their, on their communities in terms of livelihoods, education, and in employment. And our report also quantifies uh, the conservation impact uh, whenever we can. And looking at these numbers, we also, for the last two years, uh, we have uh, sought to put uh, the work of sanctuaries uh, in the larger context of threats of facing primates and other wildlife. And, you know, because threats uh, facing primates um, they don't exist in a vacuum uh, because they affect other wildlife species, um, the human communities, as well as the ecosystems. And so this year, uh, we, we have focused on the climate uh, crisis. And when it comes to climate crisis, um, it is not possible to talk about it in isolation. Uh, climate um, crisis, as well as uh, biodiversity crisis, affects all beings uh, on this planet, um, as, as Dr. White uh, just, uh, just addressed. And with the current uh, climate crisis involving global warming, we are seeing temperature, for example, temperature rising in Central Africa, twice the global average rate. And the impact, um, the impact this has impact on ecosystems and biodiversity uh, in the region. And added to this, uh, the very ways uh, that primates uh, organize their societies, they live in as groups, and, and you know, the way that they, they live as groups uh, make it uh, harder for them to adapt to ever-changing and rapidly changing uh, environmental crisis that, they, that, that they're facing. And in the meantime, uh, the human population in Africa is, is growing rapidly. Um, actually, last year, our census report focused, focused on that. And you know, the populations in, in Africa is, is expected to nearly double by 2050. So that's going to create additional strength on resources and raising the likelihood of human wildlife conflict. conflict. And so taken together, these factors create an interconnected systems that will require efforts on, on all fronts uh, in solving the climate crisis. And the climate impact crisis is already occurring, um, not only in, in Africa, 
but also and in many uh, regions around literally every corner um, of our planet. Um, as I said earlier, temperatures are rising um, and, and droughts have tripled uh, since 1979 and floods also have increased by more than 10 times uh, in recent uh, years. And, and, you know, to, to me, you know, we're talking about these numbers and sometimes, you know, talking about numbers can, can get us sort of numb. And, and so I think it's very important to put these numbers um, into context, especially, you know, the impact on individual animals, uh, as well as on us, um, human communities. And, you know, I will give an example of our, our uh, member sanctuaries uh, in Uganda, Ngamba Island uh, chimpanzee sanctuary that experienced the extreme floods uh, firsthand in 2020, uh, but uh, two years ago. Um, so after severe months long uh, rains uh, that have caused flooding in Lake, Lake Victoria, where they are based, and so waters broke, the sanctuary's retaining walls and submerged the island's only pier. So chimpanzees, uh, before the flooding, uh, they could you know, access different parts um, of the island. And, and now with the flooding and the pier it was gone. And so they risk drowning if they try to reach to their favorite you know, parts of the, the, the island. Um, and then so that's affecting, you know, has a direct impact um, on these individual animals. And, and thanks to the generosity of PASA supporters, uh, the team on the ground um, was able to build a new pier and a retaining wall uh, so that chimpanzees can once again um, reach, you know, their favorite parts um, of the island. And you know, climate uh, impacts um, also affect um, habitats. Uh, the ground, there's a groundbreaking uh, research uh, study last year by uh, Dr. Joanna Cavallo and her colleagues. And they projected that in less than 30 years, less than 30 years, uh, we could be losing as much as 94% of the suitable great ape habitat due to climate change. And even if we were able to, if we're able to reduce uh, greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse emissions, the best case scenario in this study was a loss of 85% of, of habitat. So, you know, it's, it's either way, um, it's a terrible, terrible uh, figure. And the apes, um, the primates habitat is under extreme pressure uh, from human encroachment, a clearing of wild areas um, that are rendering existing habitats no longer, they're no longer suitable. And even though new habits um, might become suitable, but if, for example, higher elevations, uh, areas that have been, you know, previously not hospitable, uh, but, you know, researchers, they, they, they didn't have much hope uh, that apes um, would be able to adapt within such a short uh, window of time. And so the timeline, we're talking about less than 30 years. And this is really, you know, a blink um, of an eye in terms of adaptation. And primates um, are, are highly social uh, animals. Uh, you know, if we think about their biological characteristics, um, it's very close to close to humans. You know, they have slow life cycles, um, they have low pr uh, reproductive rates, and they they produce uh, small litters. And so, these biological uh, traits that make them uh, close, our closest relatives, actually work against them in terms of adjusting quickly to these environmental changes. And the climate change uh, the, the impacts um, also put pressure on the food supplies that the primates need, rely on in the wild. And, and that pressure on the food supplied um, you know, will increase competition for food among primate species and with other wildlife species. Um, and this pressure um, on, on food sources 
uh, food sources could also you know, result um, in higher rates um, of, of primate uh, infant mortality and could disrupt the tight social cohesion of animal groups. Now, you know, I talk enough about um, the, the green pictures um, of, of climate um, crisis and its impact uh, on the ground. And, and this is, you know, the reality that, um, you know, many sanctuary uh, member sanctuaries operate um, every day. Uh, but, you know, as you would expect, uh, from the kind of people uh, who create wildlife sanctuaries. Um, in, in my mind, you know, they are nothing uh, but, but resilient. Um, they have uh, decades um, of experiences um, in their communities, um, and they are very resourceful uh, in finding uh, solutions uh, to address uh, climate change threats and other threats facing wildlife. So for example, um, one example is um, in Cameroon, uh, which is run by uh, Cameroon. We have a sanctuary, Samaga Yang Chimpanzee Sanctuary, and they have a small scale uh, agriculture uh, project uh, where they work with, uh, with farmers uh, and learn new techniques to improve uh, crop yields and also create a, a new forest canopy. And by creating uh, uh, these new forest canopy and increasing uh, crop yields, and they not only, they have double benefits, you know, they benefit, uh, they have the benefits of combating climate change, uh, but also fighting food security. And Sierra Leone, our member sanctuary, uh, Taguma, uh, Takaguma um, uh, Chimpanzee Sanctuary, uh, they are working along the coast to protect mangrove swamps. And these are critical ecosystems and very important way to deal with rising water levels. And Tagugama, they work with women and they have women's team that have developed a conservation project. And they are also working with more than 70 communities in Sierra Leone and are driving 16 of the United Nations uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, uh, in the country. And in the DRC, our member sanctuary, Lola Yabunobo, uh, they work with the government and the communities in creating new protected areas, uh, hundreds, and, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of new protected areas where they can release uh, bonobos uh, back to the wild. And so there are many stories like this uh, by sanctuaries around the world, not just in Africa, but also by other conservation advocates and organizations on the ground. Um, you know, with, with sanctuaries, they have a fantastic extensive knowledge um, of local conditions, understanding the local conditions and with the expertise, um, they are very well positioned to be the change agents on the front line uh, to combat climate emergencies and also threats uh, facing other wildlife. And next, um, I, will, I will turn to our next speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Gladys. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Conservation Through Public Health. And Dr. Gladys um, is, is one of the leading Conservation, con conservation scientists uh, working on saving critically endangered mountain gorillas. And most recently, uh, she was recognized uh, by the United Nations uh, as a champion of the earth. And it's you know, one of the highest recognitions uh, for those working in nature conservation. And she will be giving a One Health pers perspective and how it uh, interconnects uh, with the climate change crisis. Dr. Gladys, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I will start my presentation. Um,
Are you able to see it? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> right. Are you able to see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much again. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and it's really shocking to see how climate change is really affecting the great apes, which are already endangered. Um, I think all the great ape species are already endangered and yeah, climate change is not making things better for them. I've uh, been working with mountain gorillas for quite a long time, I'd say 25 years. But even before that, I worked with other species. I actually got involved in primate conservation through research. And I worked with um, chimpanzees first. Before I even working with chimps in Budongo, I worked with chimpanzees in very briefly, because when I was doing my vet school in London, at the Royal Vet College University of London, I got an opportunity to work with captive chimps in the Entebbe Zoo, which eventually became the Uganda Wildlife Education Center. And that time, they mainly had orphan animals, and they were victims of the bushmeat trade, of which chimps were the main victim that was being looked after. And so that's my, that was my first experience. And I was really fascinated by how intelligent they were. Then later got to study helminth parasites, intestinal parasites of chimps in Budongo Forest under Professor Vernon Reynolds in 1992. And then in 94 studied parasites and bacteria of mountain gorillas at Gwindi. That time it was called Uganda National Parks, but it later became Uganda Wildlife Authority. And I was, I was supervised by Dr. Liz McPhee from International Gorilla Conservation Program. Primate conservation, has really helped Uganda. Um, it's been an opportunity for Uganda to really get out of the dark ages when almost all the animals were pushed to extinction, um, like elephants, you know, the big animals, elephants. In fact, rhinos were pushed to extinction during the 80s, but the 70s and 80s under bad governance um, with President Idi Amin. And then when primate conservation was, we recognize that we have all these cheap, these amazing, you know, we have a lot of chimpanzees, a lot of gorillas, not many gorillas, but chimpanzees. We, we found that there's an opportunity for tourism and everything changed at that point. And the future for primates increased, improved. Um, wait a minute, if you... And so, we started working with primates and the mountain gorillas, when we first started working, were only about 600, 650 when I first started working with them. This particular gorilla called Kanyonyi was one of my favorite. And his father was the lead silverback of Mubare Gorilla Group, which was the first group to be habituated for tourism in the country. And this gorilla group brought a lot of benefits for communities and made people understand that conservation is important. And if we protect the gorillas, they can become our future. So the mountain gorillas are found in two populations. There's the Virungas, which is the first discovered population, and then Bwindi, which was discovered in the late 80s. And when Bwindi was discovered, it was found that the number of mountain gorillas were about the same in both of these protected habitats. And this was an opportunity for Uganda to start benefiting from tourism. But the biggest threat to the gorillas before tourism began and during tourism is still habitat loss. And it's interesting to hear your presentation when you talked a lot about the fact that climate change is contributing to habitat loss. Um, in this case, I would say that on top of climate change, there's also very high human population growth right up to the edge of the park. So when it became a national park, they told people that they can't cut trees anymore. It used to be a forest reserve. Um, but you know, people try and cut trees around the edges, but uh, gorillas come out because they don't realize that this is where the boundary ends. And possibly before there was such human population growth, the gorillas used to range in these areas when they were, before there was a high, a lot of people right up to the edge. And now that they've lost their fear for people through habituation for tourism or research, they're beginning to go back out. Another threat to, prime, to gorillas all over Africa is poaching. But in Uganda and Rwanda, it's not poaching for gorillas, it's poaching for daika and bush pig. Whereas in 
other countries in Africa, some people actually see gorillas or chimps as a delicacy. And so then when they get caught in set snares for dike and bush pig, gorillas also get affected. My journey in conservation really started with the disease issue. I was hired as the first vet for the Wildlife Authority when gorilla tourism had begun. And they were concerned about diseases that could spread from people to gorillas, such as flu, from a tourist coming from another part of the world. Um, not very similar to COVID-19, actually. They were very worried. And so, so that's why I was hired. But the first disease that spread from people to gorillas was not from tourists, but from the local community. We had a scabies skin disease outbreak in the gorillas in 1996. Park. And how did the people come into contact with the gorillas that close to give them scabies? This particular group, actually both gorilla groups, as I mentioned, love to rent outside the park to eat people's banana plants and possibly eucalyptus trees, the back of the trees that they tell people to plant so that they don't As being curious, touch the clothing and it spread through with treatments and we're making treatment. And so children like these, these little boys were supposed to be in school, but they were herding goats just at the edge of the park, um, which means that as long as you have children who are poor and unhealthy, it is always gonna be a threat to the wildlife, the habitat of the wildlife. And so people have to have a better well-being in order for the wildlife to have a secure future. And of course the conflict, you know, not only do they eat people's banana plants, you know, they, all of it leads to cross-species disease transmission and both people and wildlife suffer. Um, this is a microhydro dam. Windy is important not only for having a charismatic great apes like the gorillas and the chimpanzees, but wind is also important for water. The forest is a very important water source and a very important climate modulator. And so that's another reason why we have to be so careful about you know, protecting the forest. But in protecting a charismatic species, that brings in a lot of tourism revenue. We're able to protect the forest, which has not only gorillas and chimpanzees, but has elephants, six species of monkeys, over 300 species of butterflies, and over you know 300 species of birds. So it's, it's got very important biodiversity and water. Water is, this really, really also resonates with the community. So this is a micro hydro dam that was built with support from UNIDO and G GIZ in order to provide water for the community and um, hydroelectricity for the community because at the time that it was set up, the electricity never reached that part of Uganda. And so we decided to found conservation through public health. Um, having worked at the Wildlife Authority and seen all these threats and spent time doing a master's in North Carolina, we decided to set up conservation through public health to promote biodiversity conservation by enabling people to coexist with gorillas and other wildlife through improving their health and the health of the animals, the health of the people and the livelihoods of the people. And this is the view you get when you come to Guindi um, from our forest. I have a very nice forest view. And inside here are all these species I talked about, the gorillas, the chimps and all the other species. And however, this forest is being threatened. Um, there's the habitat loss issue. And also there is enough space now for the growing population of gorillas to expand. And this is something we have to be very careful about. We have three integrated programs, wildlife conservation, community health, and alternative livelihoods. And with it, we focus on health and habitat conservation. We work with community health workers to promote human health and community and livestock health. And we also set up a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise to, as a way that we found that many people are unhealthy because they are poor. But our big focus is preventing con the con disease transmission between people and gorillas. And we carry out a lot of education in the communities about this issue. They really value this message because a lot of the gorilla tourism has lifted many of them out of poverty. So it's, it really resonates well with them. They don't wanna make the gorillas sick because they're benefiting from them. So we, we train community health workers to do conservation work. In Uganda, they're called village health teams. They conduct house visits, and carry out a lot of behavior change communication and group talks. And we partner with the local health centers. This is a government health center 
and luckily half our volunteers are men and half are women, which is fantastic. And we train them in all kinds of things. This is a typical family that we found, although it's now changing. People are not having babies every year, but this is basically one family. And we train, we focus on hygiene and sanitation because that helps to protect lots of diseases, prevent lots of diseases such as scabies, TB, HIV, other respiratory and diarrhea diseases. We, we promote voluntary family planning because when they can have manageable families, they're less likely to enter the forest to poach and collect firewood and they can break the poverty cycle. We promote nutrition, sustainable agriculture, and we ask, we encourage them to report homes visited by gorillas. So the volunteers then are able to address all of this and bring in the gorilla guardians who had gorillas back. There's a heightened awareness on zoonotic disease transmission, which everybody understands around Windy because that's the reason why we're having only a maximum of eight people per gorilla group per day to minimize the risk of disease transmission. And everyone understands that. Most people do anyway. Um, and they also talk about the dangers of eating bushmeat and why we should protect the forest, and as, as well as how they can benefit from ecotourism. So we carry out a lot of education. This is a behavior change flip chart with a good family and a bad family. And everyone ends up wanting to be like the good family, which has better outcomes. We do a lot of family planning, um, sensitization, and we train the volunteers to actually give injections. And we sustain them with group livestock projects. Um, which enable them to keep going in the absence of a salary. In Uganda, community health workers are not paid the salary, but if you give them incentives like group livestock projects, here in this case, they reinvested it in a village saving and loan association, they can keep going. And we haven't had dropouts of, since over the past 15 years, which is fantastic. And some of the studies we've looked at, we've looked at like um, preventing cryptosuridium and jadia. We found that Jadia had really gone down in the gorillas um, since setting up this One Health program. And we think it's a lot of it is because we have these volunteers who really focus on hygiene. And so we're really pleased that the Jadia rate has gone down, both in, in the gorillas. It's still there in the livestock and people, but it's gone down in the gorillas. And a lot of it is when we find that when we improve community health, we want we eventually see that it's making you know, improving gorilla health. So when they go into people's gardens, they want, they're less likely to find open defecation and people who are sick. So this is something that we're really focusing on. And we get them to, you know, put up cattle water troughs so that they don't, the gorillas and the cattle and the people don't share the same water sources. We, this is a place where we carry out a lot of disease investigations, looking at disease, comparative disease investigation in people, gorillas and livestock to see what they could be sharing. And we host students from around the world. Over there is Stephen, another founder member of ours. And uh, we also work with students, you know, looking at the different parasites and pathogens in the cattle, the gorillas and the livestock. But what we've seen since 2003 is that the mountain gorilla population has grown up. Actually, it's gone up steadily since the mountain gorillas were discovered in Uganda. Um, the orange one is the Virunga population, which has been known for many years, and then the blue is the mountain gorilla population in Uganda, and both of them, the Bwindian and Virunga population, have steadily gone up. And even if there's just a handful, there's just over a thousand individuals left in the wild, they're showing a positive growth trend, and this has resulted in um, mountain gorillas being better protected in community land, that has contributed to the growth trend, three to seven fold increase in homes with hand washing stations, We've seen reduced outbreaks of scabies and jadia and an increase in women taking family planning more than the greater than the national average. And other unintended positive outcomes are women are more involved in conservation and men in healthcare and family planning. Gender equity is a very important issue. Yesterday we celebrated International Women Day. And yes, women, female empowerment is important, but gender equity is, I think, even more important. Everyone should be equally involved in all these fields in order to have more holistic outcomes. We work closely with government partners to train them in our approach. And we've worked with uh, Oxford University and IIED to develop a policy brief studying our model. But I'll end off by talking about tourism. I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but maybe, um, yeah, if you can yeah, wrap up a little bit, if that's OK. OK, I will. Um, well, I did talk about tourism earlier, but um, tourism became much more of an issue 
during the COVID-19 pandemic because it was a great threat to the gorillas because COVID can easily spread to the gorillas and chimpanzees just like other diseases have spread. But it's also an opportunity because it keeps people going um, and reduces poaching. And so this is something that we found all along that when people get, before, COVID, before the pandemic, people and gorillas were getting too close to each other. We conducted research with the higher university and 60% of the time it was the people breaking the rules and 40% of the time it was the gorillas breaking the rules. And so when COVID came along and everybody was concerned, of course there had been other common flu viruses that had affected the great apes. And we were so similar to them that even the virus the SARS-CoV-2 could easily make the great apes sick because we all have a similar protein receptors. And then later on, in the beginning of 2021, captive gorillas got COVID for our symptomatic keepers and the symptoms were similar to humans. So we, having held workshops with the rangers to get people to start wearing masks, this is one of the big things we did during COVID and enforcing the distance, which the government actually increased to 10 meters from seven to 10 meters. This happened, this really helps to minimize the spread of COVID from people to gorillas or to reduce the risk very greatly. And we also continue to do it in the local communities and putting out posters, getting the gorilla guardians, human gorilla conflict team to wear masks when they had them back and the village health and conservation teams to add COVID to whatever they were doing. Um, we employed local people who were already making tablecloths for tourists, but now got them to make masks for everybody. So it kept some people in business and they didn't have to enter the forest to poach, to survive. And having set up a guerrilla conservation coffee social enterprise, we managed to get a buyer in the UK. However, we still had a gorilla that was killed during the COVID crisis by a hungry bushmeat poacher who was hunting other species. And uh, this made us realize that we needed to really start supporting you know, the local communities. Um, and we distributed fast growing seedlings to over 1,500 households. And food security then became part of our One Health model, you know, making sure that people are farming, you know, continuing to go back to farming, something they had abandoned because they were doing so well with tourism, but in the absence of tourism, they had nothing else to eat and they had to go back to poach. And generally we said to them, go back to farming, but do it sustainably and don't give up on it. Don't abandon it, even when tourism comes back. So that you always have food to eat. We promoted uh, vaccination education. We got involved in this. We sit on the COVID-19 task force because of our One Health approach to conservation and encourage people to vaccinate themselves um, so that they don't spread COVID to gorillas and or other wildlife, even lions in other parks. And then this COVID could then come back to people, um, which is a worse strain that you can't vaccinate against or treat. And the Ministry of Health was happy to make the park staff and conservation personnel working with gorillas and chimps to be among the priority groups to be vaccinated. And now we're finding that the people who are most vaccinated are those in the tourism areas and it's enabling tourism and travel to return because tourists only want to meet vaccinated people. Um, we're advocating for this approach to the 21 countries with great apes and especially to the 13 countries with tourism and 33 sites. Um, so that everybody wears masks, maintains a distance, thinks about the health of the gorillas and the chimps and not only the economic benefit, but when they're there, they should give back to the communities. And this policy brief is going to be launched at the IUC and Africa Protected Area Conference in July. We're very excited about this. We're working with the University of Exeter. If you can check out this link, Protect Great Apes from Disease. It's mainly geared towards tourists before they travel. And when they arrive, they know that they should follow these rules and become, you know, parts of the people who really make sure that great apes are protected. Other groups like International Gorilla Conservation Program even have a gorilla friendly pledge, which we're all a part of. And tourists are asked to, to be part of this pledge, to take this pledge, to make sure they're responsible tourists when they visit. And one thing that we've seen is that respiratory diseases in great apes have reduced due to mask wearing. Before COVID, it happened in Ivory Coast. When people started wearing masks, there was less respiratory disease in Ivory Coast, where Dr. Fabian Yandet works in Thai Forest. And in, in Volcano National Park in Rwanda, um, the Mountain Gorilla Vet Project found that, and the Rwandese government found that during COVID, because people are wearing masks, the gorillas have had much less respiratory diseases. For more information, please visit our website um, and follow us on social media. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gladys. Um, I, I think you know it's it's so important, and it's I'm, I'm so happy to to see the work that you're doing. Are it's a win-win situation, you know, for the communities and also for the gorillas uh, and for other wildlife. Um, that's the best case scenario where everyone wins. Um, and we will save the Q and A. I'm sure uh, audience members, you know, have questions for for you. And we will move on to the next speaker, uh, Samuel uh, from Obechita Conservancy. Um, he is the head of conserv conservancy there, and Obechita is one of the most well known conservancies uh, in Africa. Uh, is the home uh, to the largest black rhino uh, sanctuary in, in, in Africa, in East Africa, and also the home to the last two remaining northern white rhinos. And equally important uh, in my view is that Opechita is where Pasa member sanctuary, Sweetwater Chimpanzee uh, Sanctuary is located. And so Sam has, uh, Samuel has a lot on his shoulder and he will be offering the sanctuary's perspective uh, and how sanctuaries are dealing with the climate change crisis. Samuel, uh, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much um, <clears throat> for that uh, fair, fair introduction. I think um, you know I'm humbled and pleased to be here uh, to be talking about um, you know some of the impacts of climate change in um, in in the primates and and and, and other um, you know sanctuaries. Um, but you know, mainly I'll, I'll be dealing up with with what we are facing in this part of the world, which is uh, East Africa, Kenya, uh, and mainly um, in like Kibia Samburu ecosystem where Opejeta is located. Um, um, as I've just said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to mainly zero in on um, the like Kibia Samburu ecosystem, and I will be drawing quite a bit from the or Pegeta data, um, or Pegeta has been in existence uh, first as a ranch and then later on as a conservancy housing a chimpanzee sanctuary for uh, for over 30 years. Um, and so quite a bit of what I'll be talking about is either drawing from data that we've had over the years um, and, and mainly um, highlighting some of the challenges that we are facing and, and other sanctuaries alike in, in, in other parts of Africa. Um, I will then finally talk about some of the mitigation measures that we are having, we are having to adapt, you know, as a sanctuary and as a conservancy to uh, to bear with, with the consequences uh, of climate change, global warming, um, and 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 basically how that is 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 helping us stay afloat. So yeah, Opejeta is located in the central parts of Kenya. Uh, the map on your, I presume that should be on your left, uh, shows the county Laikipia with Opejeta placed in the southern parts of Laikipia County, which is uh, about uh, 10,000 square kilometers. Um, and this, this particular run, I mean, a piece of land or county is predominantly arranging uh, pastoralist um, kind of um, landscape. Um, the, the areas, the areas you're seeing, I'm not sure that you're seeing my casa, but the areas you're seeing in a shed of yellow is, um, is, is a dot of ranches that stretch from the southern parts of Laikipia all across to the north. Apegeta itself is about um, 445 square kilometers. It's, um, it, it comprises the main conservation area, uh, I mean, the main Apegeta, which is uh, 365 square kilometers and to the north, a small uh, portion of, um, um, of a larger government ranch that is now being managed by Opegeta, uh, bringing the total to 445 uh, square kilometers. Within it also is, 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 a, is a sanctuary, a uh, chimpanzee sanctuary as indicated in the Eastern portions of the, of the conservancy along the Waso, Nero uh, River that traverses the conservancy, 
training in the northern parts of Kenya, uh, which is, um, you know, Samburu, um, which is also part of the ecosystem. But I think what makes what makes Opejeta unique is the fact that it's it's an integrated, or rather embraces an integrated uh, land use uh, plan where we do both uh, wildlife conservation and livestock ranching business uh, together with other enterprises, of course, ecologies uh, within it. Um, so it is designed in such a way that it generates uh, revenues that, that are deployed to community development and wildlife conservation as, a, as an ultimate goal. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a unique model that seeks to maximize land use, seeks to maximize profitability for the purposes of being able to redeploy these resources um, for the two main aims that I, that I talked about. It is linked to the wider Laikipia Samburu ecosystem through a series of gaps. So Pejata being a, a, a rhino sanctuary as well is actually ring fenced. It has about 120 kilometers of a fence line that is solar powered. Um, and it has gaps to the north that allows for wildlife, free wildlife migration or movement uh, between Opejeta and other parts of the greater Laikipia Samburu ecosystem. Uh, and the reason why I chose to speak about uh, the landscape approach to, to, this, uh, to this issue of climate change is because we are interconnected and what happens in the north tends to affect us, um, us as a conservancy, but also us as a, you know, as a sanctuary. The wider landscape is, is quite significant, it's almost 34,000 square kilometers. Um, and, and it has two main water towers, uh, which is uh, Mount Kenya uh, Forest, uh, which is, of course, our forest um, you know, begins from the base of the mountain all the way um, to, uh, and that mountain, of course, is, 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 is a, it's quite a significant land feature in Africa. As it's the second highest mountain. Um, and then to the west of Opejeta, well, I think you can see where Opejeta sits in relation to Mount Kenya and some ranges called the Badia Ranges, which tends to affect um, the climatic zone or climatic conditions within, within the, uh, the areas where Opejeta is located. Uh, but I, in principle, uh, the reason why I showed this map is, is particularly because talking of like keep your Samburu ecosystem, you have to talk about the Awasonyiro River, which is a, quite an extensive river that flows from the water towers, as I indicated, across the landscape and is therefore a main and a major source of uh, livelihood and I mean a major source of water. Um, and of course, yes, livelihood for many communities as there is also uh, irrigation fed agriculture um, and so on. And so forth. Um, uh, but the area is also quite unique in the sense that it is a, um, a biodiversity hotspot. You know, it has 65% of Kenya's uh, endangered gravy zebra. It's, it's the second largest population of African elephant, um, only second to the Savos. Um, it also has 50% of the rhino population, and in particular actually of the critically endangered rhino population with another extensive, and actually the largest population of white rhinos in the country. Um, it, it's a host to wild dogs that are critically endangered. It is also, um, uh, you know, um, a, a key habitat for reticulated giraffes. So by and large, when you talk about that ecosystem from a species conservation point of view, it is, um, it is of critical importance. Now, when you look at the, the impact that we are seeing in that region, um, and consequently, of course, spirals down to what we experience in, in the sanctuary, you know, is the fact that obviously over the years, when you look at data, Pejeta has data, rainfall precipitation data, uh, that is almost 70, nearly 80 years. And when you plot that data over time, what is quite unique is that you see over the last couple of uh, decades, almost the last 20 years, there's an increased frequency of dry spells. Um, and other than just the, incre uh, the increase of the uh, prominence of uh, dry, uh, dry periods over the last couple of decades, um, the, the intensity of, of weather, whether you're talking about the dry spell, it is 
the dry spells are becoming much drier than we historically have any records of. Um, secondly, we're also seeing spikes in, you know, when, when, uh, when there's rains, we are seeing a lot of flooding. We've had three floodings in the last 10 years um, and, and almost none, except for El Nino in, in 1997, 1998, um, none in nearly 40 years. So obviously issues of weather, um, changes in weather um, are quite real in this region. And obviously these are driven predominantly by human activities. Um, and consequently, you know, we, we, we are living at times where we have to change our way of, of, of life, adopt the changes uh, that, are, that are happening. Um, and consequently, you know, the, the landscape is, is having quite a bit of dynamics in terms of um, how we do um, business and how we uh, acquire our livelihoods and so on and so forth. But I think a statement I post in my presentation that, uh, that depicts the irony of the situation is that we might be facing uh, the consequences or impact of climate change uh, quite significantly, despite the fact that we may not be the key drivers for this change. And that is quite unfortunate and has been pointed out by a number of speakers that uh, came before me. So we, we are grappling with the issue and we may not originators of this issue. Um, as I said, some of the impacts that we are seeing in the region as a result of, some of what I've just said is prolonged dry spells. We, across the landscape, currently we have a drought in, in the northern parts of Kenya. Uh, Opejeta itself is experiencing um, quite a dry spell. It's not, it's not a drought. We had a bit of rains um, in December. They were obviously delayed, but they were uh, fairly scattered in some areas sufficient. And so we, we are seeing a lot of wildlife migration from the north down southwards and congregating around, um, around Opejeta and areas and community areas around Opejeta where there was a bit of rains. Um, you know, and, and, and these activities are really driving change in how we utilize resources. 90% um, of, of the water coming off from the towers I talked about gets abstracted almost before it leaves the reserves or the parks or the forest reserves that, uh, that host these towers, uh, which tells you that the communities living downstream have quite a number of, of serious challenges uh, on, on coping uh, with, with the drought that I talked about and the dry spell. Uh, in fact, uh, given that that river and, and the drainage and the basin that I showed you earlier on supports nearly 2 million people, you know, consequences of overuse of extraction of water resources within uh, within the forest and all that is quite dire, and and this is not uh, it's terrible because obviously human population in these parts of the world, um, in, in both Laikipia and Samburu, is is burgeoning, is increasing, and and therefore it means natural resources can only continue to be used um, at a very high rate, yeah, causing a lot of conflict um, in the process. In fact, the government has had to take stand measures, you know, lock down forests, no extraction of timber and stuff like that. I think it's a positive move, but, um, but you know, the rate at which we were losing forests means the primates, uh, other species that depend on, on, on forest ecosystem and stuff like that. Uh, are really, really suffering. Uh, the, other, the other thing I would want to draw your attention to is the fact that 70% of Kenya's wildlife population sits outside protected areas or protected lands, um, which means that, you know, despite the fact that human populations are increasing, the fact that, you know, the population of livestock within some of these arid and some arid, area, some arid areas is, is doubling, um, it means that there is over concentration, of course, overuse, overuse um, of, of pasture land, uh, which is leading to uh, clustering and over concentration of wildlife populations within, within smaller areas, which further drives um, other consequences such as shrinking habitats. Um, you know, it, 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 it drives also wildlife populations into community areas, increasing human wildlife conflict. 
um, and the human wildlife conflict, of course, means less and less tolerance or coexistence with this wildlife, uh, which means generally other areas are gradually being lost as dispersal areas for, for wildlife. And you know, the fact is we're beginning to, to see, and over the last couple of years, we've seen um, as a result of dry, you know, excessive rains in, in the Horn of Africa, and then followed by dry spells, high temperatures, you're seeing things like locusts, you know, uh, be blossoming and, 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 you know, flying south into the northern parts of Kenya. We had quite a bit of this happening uh, two or three years ago. And, and of course, comes along other, other um, diseases that are related to climate change and the variations, you know, extreme weather conditions that we are seeing, you know, We've, we've lost quite a number of population of, um, of um, jackals and hyenas and all that to canine distemper and others, um, which is obviously consequences of these extreme weather, weather conditions. But when you look at the sanctuary, which is located uh, squarely within, within Opejeta and in, the, in an area of about 250 acres along the Awasonero River, it means that uh, when there is over extraction, overuse, we end up with very low uh, water levels. And the sanctuary as it was designed was such that uh, one population of rescued individuals uh, was on either, you know, there was a population on either side of the river. You know, we regard it as Western and Eastern population. And these are separated by the river. When the river goes down, of course, there is chance of the two populations mixing, conflict, you could lose individuals. And so most of the time we are forced to erect barriers and fences uh, so that the chimpanzees are not able to get to the river, which is, which is um, a shame. Again, as a result of land degradation in the, in the far north and also in the immediate uh, areas, we are seeing a lot of siltation, therefore, having to rethink how we manage the, the, the river causeway within the chimp sanctuary, because siltation obviously means that the depth of water is uh, compromised and you could have also patches and land in between uh, where these chimps can, can cross. The other thing is obviously we depend on the local communities to provide food um, for, for, for the sanctuary as for food supplementation, as, um, as many of you might, are aware is that the Sweetwater Chimpanzee Sanctuary was set up in 1993 and it was to house rescued individuals from, from um, Rwanda Burundi during the 1993-94 genocide and has continued to play the role of um, you know, a rescue and a home, a lifelong home for chimpanzees that are confiscated across, um, across the world in, in, in you know, being trafficked for pets or bushmeat, uh, you know, which results in young ones being uh, left destitute. And so this, this sanctuary has continued to host these chimps. And because this is not necessarily their native area, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, feeding and food supplementation. And when prices fluctuate because of issues of climate change, you know, um, it impacts the operations and the costs uh, we have to incur to run the sanctuary. Which is which is quite interesting, um, in the sense that you know it is it is effectively affecting human populations in, in almost a similar similar manner as the chimps. Um, then, of course, when you have small spaces that are that are fenced off, such as the thing, the chimp sanctuary, um, in these areas tend to regenerate and have perhaps quote unquote better vegetation that the area and the areas that surround the sanctuary because of uh, normal day-to-day -day use by wildlife. And so with, with the impacts of dry spell uh, being experienced within the conservancy and other areas around, there's usually a lot of pressure by things like elephants, breaking infrastructure, getting, getting into the chimp sanctuary, um, and, and, and that of course adds to the cost that we are having to incur, particularly now, in repair offenses, uh, in, in trying to control the wildlife that is getting into, into these spaces. And the other thing is that over time we realize there's, there's almost a direct correlation between the dry spells and the number of diseases that we have to, to treat among the chimpanzee population uh, in the sanctuary. And, and the, the, more, uh, the more we experience these sort of dry spells, the more 
we spend on veterinary care, on, on treatment and so on and so forth. So um, I think the impact of climate change um, does not only impact on food and, and the availability of food to the chimps and to the other animals, uh, but also causes uh, some, some diseases that otherwise would not be seen in, in wildlife populations. Um, but as, as, as one of the uh, participants of the panelists said that, uh, <clears throat> you know, these are changes that have happened over time and we are finding ourselves, you know, asking how can we contribute, how can we uh, come up with ways of mitigating uh, some of the impacts that we are seeing, how can we help change um, our ways of life to contribute in our own small way uh, towards, um, you know, reduction in greenhouse gases. And, and some of the things that we are doing as, a, as an organization is one, cutting emissions. We, we've, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, focused on ensuring that all our, you know, generators, all our power source um, is, is going to be, util you know, going to be tapped from solar, solar power because that reduces emissions. Uh, traditionally, I and mean, in the past, we've, we've had um, most ranches, in fact, rely on, on boreholes to supply water for, for livestock and for wildlife. And most of these boreholes are powered by diesel pumps, which, which are not, of course, compliant from a you know, global warming reduction uh, point of view. So the conservancy hopes that in the next couple, five years or so, um, we will be emission free from those kind of sources. We are also working, of course, with the, with the Kenyan government to ensure that we restore areas that are degraded, both in the neighboring areas, because we work with communities um, to ensure that we plant more trees, we, we change their ways of life in the sense that uh, for communities that use fuel wood, for example, if you have efficient stocks, you're likely to cut down you know, on, on, on uh, the number of um, you know, trees that are being cut or the firewood that is being used for daily, uh, for, for cooking in, in the community areas. Uh, we are also actively engaging other partners and doing tree planting um, together with communities. Um, <clears throat> we are also working on different ways of assisting community adapt to the changes we are seeing, better means of agriculture, conservation agriculture, for example, which, which does not, um, harm the, you know, the, the environment and is, is therefore likely able to produce more yields uh, to the communities. Uh, there is, of course, we have an in-house um, monitoring team that looks at uh, the ecological um, or monitors the, the ecology of, of, the, of the conservancy and undertakes research to detect, to detect any changes over time both in uh, habitats and wildlife species. And I think that is important in, in, in adopting to the changes that we are seeing, you know, being able to move wildlife, we, we have to, or being able to, um, to, to manage resources, you know, manage our, wild, our livestock uh, herds in, in a way that appreciates the sort of changes that we, we are facing now. Um, <clears throat> and also including, uh, included in that is, is a program that looks at um, or does disease surveillance, looking at what, what is predominantly being reported among wildlife populations. Um, as I said, we are connected to the landscape through the corridors and therefore what you sample within and slightly beyond is likely uh, an expression of the sort of disease surveillance prevalence in a very wider landscape. And together with Kenya Wildlife Service, then you are able to advise and help and shape sort of uh, the policy being uh, adopted by the government. Um, <clears throat> we are also looking at how we can collaborate with other players in the region. You know, we have uh, many NGOs, we have the Kipia Conservancy Association, we have the Northern Rangeland Trust and others in this space that we are working uh, together uh, to, to mitigate any, any uh, impact of, of, of climate change that we see, uh, habitat degradation, you know, better ways of um, herding and keeping livestock that is less harmful to the environment and so on and so forth. 
The other thing I mentioned is uh, human wildlife conflict increasing because of wildlife dispersal in community areas in search for pastures and, and water. Um, you know, coming up with teams that are able to respond quickly so that communities don't become wary of wildlife presence or, you know, to mitigate uh, the conflict that is being experienced in the, in the region. Um, the, the other bit is, of course, being the model we are, that is a, a pretty um, modern and, 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 and uh, robust model that acknowledges that human ways of life and, and, and conservation must coexist in a harmonious way. And that, uh, you know, if, if well monitored such a system, uh, can can uh, can be very attractive, you know, both in the eyes of government, politically speaking, and and so working with lands that are similar to Opejeta, we are able to sell out some of these ideas and and secure lands uh, that are north of us, such as what I mentioned, you know, government land that that we are now managing that sees the benefit of adopting such a model, and that will help us secure a wider. Uh, or at least ensure that there is land sufficient for wildlife dispersal in the, in the region. Um, and I think, yeah, thank you. I think um, it, it's, it's becoming quite, quite important for us to, to, to look at this resource as a resource that, uh, that is under serious and immense pressure, uh, both because of the climate change issues that we uh, we are seeing, but also uh, because of the increase in human populations. And, you know, by working together, collaborating with other institutions, you know, um, we, we, we are likely going to see the change uh, and, and, and going to circumvent uh, some of the challenges that, that are being placed by, by the changes of, um, brought about by climate change. So thank you. Uh, Asante Sana, Samuel, um, it's, it's really important uh, to hear, you know, firsthand perspective and practical experiences in, in how sanctuaries uh, tackle climate change crisis. And, and you know, maybe I, if I'm sensing that maybe, you know, there's a need for further uh, discussion, exchange of information between sanctuaries on how, you know, sharing solutions and, and various ongoing projects so that we, you know, move forward together and brainstorming and, you know, sharing best practices. Um, so that's definitely, you know, for me, I'll put it on PASA's uh, agenda uh, to work on. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for staying on uh, the webinar. And uh, Dr. Lee White uh, unfortunately has to, to leave, uh, but he gave us the permission to collect questions for him and pass along to him uh, so that he can address them. And now I will turn to my colleague, Jeans. Uh, I know we're you know, running over time, so maybe one or two questions, mm -hmm. um, if possible. Yeah, thank you, Iris, um, and thank you to the amazing presenters. That was fascinating, um, heartening to see the great work that's going on, and also really sobering to see how much is ahead of us to make it right. Um, so I just want to express my appreciation for the for everything that you all are doing already. Um, I'm proud to be with you in this, and I hope we can turn the tide uh, in the ways that we need to. Um, so. We haven't seen, I haven't seen a lot in the um, chat. So uh, if you do have questions, I'd invite you to place them there. Uh, but I did wanna ask, um, since we still have Gladys and Samuel, uh, we've heard some very discouraging things tonight and we all, I think we all know that the, the path ahead is going to be a difficult one, um, but what gives you hope in this, in this situation? I would love to hear, um, maybe Gladys, would you like to start and then we'll hear from Samuel. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the question. Um, I would say that what gives me hope is that, um, you know, that even if there's so much going on, you know, with climate change, habitat loss, increase in disease, prevalence of disease, and, you know, people suffering around protected areas, the few areas where things are improving is what gives me hope. And I believe that if these few areas can be scaled up to other areas all over Africa, 
the wildlife will have a very secure future. We'll start to get the populations back. So just a few, you know, the pilot projects that are working in the different areas that are seeing success, you know, increasing wildlife populations, um, people are managing to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Uh, you know, habitats are beginning to be restored. You know, those few places, if those projects can be scaled up across Africa, maybe through landscape approaches um, or species specific approaches, I think that gives me hope for the future. Thank you. Uh, and Samuel, how, what gives you hope? Um, thank you. I, what gives me hope is the fact that people are beginning to recognize that this is, um, this is a challenge that is here with us uh, and, and therefore beginning to put in place measures to mitigate uh, the impacts of climate change. You know, the fact that there's been a lot of denial of people arguing that this may not, is really just a cyclic thing. You will always have a drought every, every now and then and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, as evidenced by the last COP uh, conference, people are now admitting to the fact that if we continue like this, we will definitely face a collapse and, and things um, will spiral and get out of control. So the hope is in the fact that people are recognizing the problem and working together collaboratively to resolve the challenges. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, we did have one question come in, um, and this is from Florian Keitel. Uh, I hope I said your name right. Uh, the question is, how can anyone help in day-to-day -day activities? So if you've got any, I, I know, Samuel, you pointed out many things that uh, the team at El Pejeda is doing to minimize your impact. Um, so I would invite you or Anne Gladys to share any thoughts you have on, on how we can help. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, for us, you know, we are very happy to accept volunteers, people who want to volunteer, offer their advice, um, make comments on the different reports that we put out or social media posts, um, visit and see the impact. And, you know, there's so many ways that people can contribute to help the wildlife and the people who we work with, definitely. These are all areas that people can help. And even something as small as, you know, responsible consumption, you know, buying, <laughs> buying coffee from areas where, you know, the farmers are being helped so that they don't have to enter the forest to poach and collect firewood, which will then affect the habitat of endangered wildlife. That's just one way of helping, even if you're not able to come out. But, you know, doing research with us, volunteering with us, all those areas, all those are ways that people can help and spreading awareness about these issues and giving donations, all of this makes a huge difference. Um, <clears throat> thank you. To add on to, to that, I think the fact is some of the challenges we are, we are facing, particularly on, on extreme weather conditions, for example, are quite unpredictable. You know, um, you have your weather forecast, um, you know, and your normal seasons and everything. Uh, but then occasionally you will get these flash floods, uh, you will get these fires that, that break out due to surface temperatures and other things. Um, I think one of the ways that, uh, that, that uh, you know, conservation areas and sanctuaries can get support in is, is for people being um, aware that we are going to be dealing with these issues now more than ever in the past. And I'm really grateful, for example, to PASA for, for standing with us on occasions where we had, uh, you know, floods washing away fences or, or even in, um, in cases where there's disease outbreak, I think, uh, not, not Ebola, but rather uh, COVID. <clears throat> yeah, COVID, which, which came in, in an unpredictable, with an unpredictable consequences. And, and I think for people to be so sensitive to to nature and so to being so sensitive to species conservation um, oriented um, kind of approaches is, is really important. And, and, and strategically an organization such as, you know, those, those in the position of PASA, thinking strategically and, and mobilizing resources and making them available uh, for cases where we have random 
or you know disasters or emergencies i think that that would really be uh, something that can help sanctuaries i think also being a bit more proactive innovative um, new ways of dealing with the challenges that we are facing is something that uh, that 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 we're welcoming the world to 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 help um, you know provide ideas and and really contribute towards better conservation uh, because obviously universities other research entities are collecting a lot of data um, you know there's the house information that that can be made available or even create platforms for discussions um, you know alliances such as pass as well you know creating platforms which I know you're already doing, uh, but it's also one way of encouraging sharing of that, uh, of knowledge, sharing of um, potential, potential solutions to, to the challenges we face. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Samuel. Um, that's, you know, I, I think, you know, that's precisely why PASA was founded in, in the per first place is to have this platform uh, so that we can collectively uh, help primates and, and other, other wildlife. And we will continue to su support our member uh, sanctuaries and also uh, uh, supporters uh, within our network. So with that, um, with that uh, hopeful remarks from Dr. Gladys and, and Samuel, um, I wanna thank you everyone uh, for being um, here and listening to these uh, fantastic presentations by our distinguished speakers. And uh, please feel free to check out PASA's website, um, how you can connect with individual um, PASA member sanctuaries and how to connect with us. And we will look forward to seeing you uh, at our next webinar. And much thanks again to Dr. Gladys and Samuel and everyone who um, are here with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and thanks to the entire panelists and, and viewers. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much, everyone. And uh, yes, yeah. until next time. Yes, until next time. And thanks so much, Pasa, <laughs> and the whole, yep. the whole community. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank sure. you, Dr. Gladys. We'll be in touch. Thank you, and bye. Thanks, everyone. And we'll send out the recording. Bye bye. All right.